there we are live <laughs> i'm not sure if people will uh, will actually see that though okay come here i know you can do it there oh. there's, <laughs> there's no way people will miss this he's a lap dog yes yes he is <laughs> that is awesome oh you know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna do this this is gonna get weird Okay. There we go. All right. <clears throat> Aww. <laughs> he just removed my headphones. Can't hear anything. No, stop removing my headphones. I don't know if this will work for me as well. Let's see. Chuck. Hey, Chuck. Okay. Now I can hear again. Nope. Nope. What? Oh, I was trying to see if I could summon my dog, but no. My dog... My dog does not uh, does not obey. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, hey, how's it going? It's it's going well. So so our viewers have now seen oh. Eddie. Is that is this how I summon a dog? All right, hold on. Let's see. Let's see. Come on, Chuck. Come on. Come on up. Come on. Nope. Nope. You gotta you gotta come up, Chuck. Come on. Is she gonna be my lap dog? Come on. Come on. I think she's like done something wrong. Thank you. All right. But this is like she's been taught to never jump up like that. Oh, Izzy will do it. <laughs> and then over here? No, we can't even see her. Oh well. <laughs> you just gonna pick her up? Oh. <laughs> Come right, on, you want one of that? Oh, you get it? All right, Izzy, come on. Come on, Izzy. There you go. You go up, Izzy. Oh, 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 there it is. Come on, you can do it, you can do it. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, now, get down, bad dog. <laughs> come on, Chuck. Oh, you... <laughs> all right, we got to remove our dogs. Okay. Will Eddie be at the Eclipse event? Of course. Uh, yeah, sure. I can do that. <laughs> um, Upshift to 720p, says Larry Beckham. So was the last show that we did in 720? Or this should be 1080. Or are you just going to like – you're anyway. I have no idea. Um, what else That's on that? your side. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, do you have the uh, live chat? Do you want the... Yes, please. Okay, hold on. Should have gotten that organized beforehand. <laughs> uh, there you go. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, so our weather's nice. Um, yeah, um, ours too. It's oh. super, like, creepy. It's not supposed to be this nice. Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. Like, we wrapped up horrible six weeks plus of winter like just really freezing cold and then we switched uh over to beautiful sun warm it's really nice cool yay summer is back not quite um let's see any little pieces of announcement uh to make um if you don't have your rooms yet for the eclipse contact Susie. we're opening up more rooms okay. um we don't have more spaces we just have more hotel rooms mm. um okay. that's all i've got okay um any other news uh did you you were sort of hinting at what was going on last week we talked a bit about it any more news about about uh where Cosmo Quest is? Can I so, can I change your your introduction now? Um. Yes. What is your yes, title? I am the director of technology and citizen science at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. There you go. There it is. All right. Let me let me just let me just put this into the intro. This is gonna be fun. All right. Uh, you are the, so say it again, you're the director of technology and citizen science. Technology and citizen, that sounds like someone made up her own title. And the director of Cosmo Quest. 
It, it was two different positions that, because me. Yeah. At, oh, sorry, Director of Citizen Science at the, <laughs> the Astronomical Pacific. Society of the, the Astronomical Pacific. Astronomical Society of the Pacific. And the director of Cosmo Quest. So what happened? I do. Should we talk about it in the uh, in the show briefly? Just mention that you that you know we we don't need to get into the <laughs> depths of it, but but just the gist is that now um, Cosmo Quest and Astronomy Cast and Astrosphere and everything we do is housed the under Society. the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, which is based in San Francisco. Right. Yes. That's it. That was the gist of what we'll say in the show. Okay, cool. So you were all wondering, you know, like people had actually noticed that I had changed your title. And if you go back. Really? Yeah. Well, yeah. Because, you know, obviously I go like a professor at Southern Illinois University. Of Edwards. And so we dropped that. You are no longer ago. at Southern Illinois University. Edwards. Right. You are now operating the organization out of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, which is so cool. And and this is my first chance in a long time to work side by side with a number of other astronomers, which will provide provide all of us with just a more collegial in terms of like colleagues in our field yeah. as situation. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really excited. Uh, and it's closer for me, so I'll be able to come down and uh, and hang out in San Francisco with uh, yes. you and the rest of the Astronomical Society. So I'm going to say hi to some people. Hi to Adam, Sy Adam Synergy, Daniel McCool, Dave Regan, uh, Dane Kavu, Ilit Avron, Greg Nickel, Helg Birkog, Hugh High Champ One, Hugo Burnham, Danny Romanov, Cherengovsky, John Morrison, John Morrison, John Suffield, Leonard Clark, Nancy Graziano, Nicholas of the Yard, Oberon Knights here, Richard Clark, Richie Selfridge, Ryo San, S. Wolberg, Sylvan Westby, Steve Heistan, Stir Fry Kitty, Tak Tang, Toby Samples, Tom Nathy, William Vandebeek, Zach Cody, Zap Fan, Zap Fan, and Zeth Loveless. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Astronomy Cast. I guess we should do this show. Probably. Um, oh, I don't have my soft. I have all the other software in the world open. Let me change what I have open. Okay. So if we're a little more discombobulated than most Fridays, I, it's just been a weird day given uh, the the all the news that's going on and um, yeah. Yeah, well, we don't want to turn our chat into a political. No, 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 so. we're not going to. That, no. That's why yeah. it, it's just we are. I, I don't know about you, but I was like, and I shall watch Khan Academy videos on probability now. And I got sucked down a. I thought you were just. Oh, yeah. Hole. I thought you, you. And pictures of meerkats. And picture. I did. I replaced both my screen backgrounds with photos of meerkats because meerkats. Mm hmm. Uh, okay. And I'm going to be sniffling into the microphone, for which I apologize. All right. Say when. I'm pressing record. It's I, recording. I am also pressing record, and it is also recording. Hey, Chad. Hello, Chad. New microphone today, so I hope it doesn't suck. Um, okay. Astronomy Cast, episode 436. Common miscom... Oh. <laughs> Do you want to start over? Yeah, let's just start the whole thing over, and then Chad will never know. Okay. A terrible secret. Yeah, okay. he will. Say when. He will find out somehow. Hold on. Uh, pressing record. Okay. Recording. I am also recording. Hello, Chad. Hello, Chad. Astronomy Cast, episode 436, Common Misconceptions in Probability. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of University, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay. Whew, gotta, gotta, here we go. The Director of Technology and Citizen Science at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and the Director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. So this is like the first time for the 10 years that we've been doing this show that I gave you a new title. Well, that's not entirely true. People, <laughs> astute listeners noticed that over the last uh, 
couple of months, we dropped the professor title and then and then just went the director of Cosmo Quest, and now I just gave you a new title. I don't know whether I'll do it every week. It's very long. It's a mouthful. But um, it, yes. So you want to give people the one minute version of this? So, so the short version is um, I've been at the same institution for 10 years and um, now we're at a new institution. Yeah. I wanted to be surrounded by other astronomers yeah. um, and now I'm surrounded by other astronomers. I'm at an organization that has a female director that has a lot of people that I really respect working there. It's over a hundred years old and has been part of increasing scientific literacy through astronomy for those 100 years. And I, I like all of the other fields of study, but it gets lonely. Mm -hmm. And now I have other people and access to journals and all sorts of things. And I don't have to move. That's right. You're so, doing this virtually. Yeah. yeah. So, so me and Corey, um, we're, we're, transitioning together and and this is our chance to to start over in the same place in a new place yeah no fantastic and uh <clears throat> they're just a wonderful group of people at the asp uh I, you know i've worked with uh, of, of several of in the past on doing some of our virtual star parties and uh i'm really excited and and they're located in san francisco which is a a uh, great city relatively nearby to where I am on Vancouver Island. So I hope to be able to participate in in person uh, more which down there, which will be great. Yes. Uh, the second thing is I'm testing out a different microphone because people were complaining. So if my microphone sounds a little weird today, that's because I'm using my older microphone. So I apologize. I'm just troubleshooting. Uh, all right, let's move on. So human beings are bad at so many things, but we're particularly terrible at understanding probability in any rational way. We underestimate, overestimate, and generally mess up probability. We're going to try and fix it today, but we will surely fail because we're just literally hardwired to mess this up. <clears throat> at least I, that's, I like our odds of screwing this up. I, I think we are hard, hardwired to misunderstand probability because otherwise um, we'd probably die because if you think about it, it's in our best interests to be overly cautious. And in other cases, I think we're programmed to not understand probability because we take stupid risks that ultimately benefit society, even if a fair number of us die along so the way. So tell me how this topic came up in your brain. <laughs> so um, I was at Aresia last week. Um, which is a science fiction fantasy conference that's held in Boston, my fair city. Um, and I was on a panel on, and these are the way we shall destroy the earth. And it was actually, these are the ways we'll destroy civilization. So it was even, it went that extra step. And someone in the audience made the comment that we didn't need to bring up super volcanoes or asteroids because every year that goes by that we don't have a super uh, volcano or asteroid goes off lowers the probability of these things occurring. <laughs> and, and since we haven't experienced these things since, well, Chinese record keeping days, um, we can We're just the clock. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so here we are. There's a super volcano under Naples that's getting ready to go. And, and people think that because we haven't had one go off in a long time, we don't need to worry about it. But the chances are the same every year. And this is the problem. There, there, there is probability of any given year having a particular event, and there's a probability of a sequence of years. And, and so the probability of flipping four heads in a row and the probability of any one of those being heads are not the same probability. <clears throat> right, of course. So I'm losing my voice here. Um, yeah. So you... I need to deal with a dog one more. <coughs> oh, sorry. You? Are, gonna... Are you going to deal with the dog? Whoa. 
Sorry, everybody. Your video dropped off. Uh, that is... Okay, there we go. <clears throat> okay, all, right. all is well. Oh, so Sorry, Chad. You, Sorry, Chad. Somebody gave you a, uh, an acronym for your, uh, for your new title. <clears throat> <laughs> That's about right. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, so the, the classic analogy of this, of course, right, is that you flip a coin. And you flip the coin, and it comes up heads or tails. Yes. Like, say it comes up heads, and then you flip it again, and it comes up heads. And then you think, like, what are the chances that I'm going to flip this again? It's going to come up heads again. The reality, of course, is that it's going to – it's a 50-50 chance every time, right? Yes. And this is the, the gambler's fallacy. There was actually a great – podcast over on Freakonomics and they covered this uh, this a bit about probabilities and sort of our, our ability to make decisions and just that <clears throat> you know in so many fields we will um we will make this mistake in terms of like you know it's happened one way so many times so the chances are that it's going to switch now right the game you know, I've lost so many times at the blackjack table so this has got to be the one where I'm going to win. But of course, every time you go into it, you're dealing with the same kinds of odds. And and so so here's where you have to ask, am I asking what is the probability of a sequence of events? Am I asking what is the probability of a group of objects doing something? So do I need to look at probabilities like you do with radioactive half-lives? Am I looking at the probability of a single uncoupled event? So dependent versus independent variables. And, and then there's that whole, is it a group of things that are all dealing with this probability simultaneously, like with radioactive half-lives? So let's talk about the, well, let's go back and talk about that asteroid destruction. So, so what are the chances that a gigantic asteroid are gonna, is going to smash into the earth and kill us all? So, so the, the kill us all is, is basically one in 65 million any given year. <laughs> right. Which is it, in that about every 65 million years, a gigantic asteroid smashes into the earth and wipes out most life on the surface of the planet. Therefore, and disturbingly, this last happened about 65 million years ago. Right. And so you are then, you know, here on the surfaces of the earth, you are experiencing a year on earth. This year, you've got a one in 65 million chance. Uh, I just did a video about the Carrington event that you've got about a one in 500 chance of, yeah. of the... Um, you know, of a gigantic solar storm wiping out all our technology. They take about once every 500 years or so. So each of these things. So then where so where is the fallacy coming in, right? Why are you thinking that it, as the, the longer these things happen, the more likely it is that it's going to happen or the less likely it is that it's going to happen? What was, you know, what? So, so this is where you have to start looking at it in terms of we don't, fully understand the statistics of asteroid impacts. So, and asteroids, comets, I'm using that term asteroid to refer to both. And, and so what open variables we don't fully understand are, is there something that's disturbing the Kuiper belt on a regular basis or disturbing the Oort cloud on a regular basis that is causing a cyclic phenomena of extra amounts of objects come plunging in. So that's one possibility, in which case we're looking at something where you go through periods of decreased actual probability those years, and then increased probability because it's a cyclic event, more like a plague of, of uh, cicadas upon your house, you know? Right. Every seven years, there's going to be a bazillion cicadas if you live somewhere, somewhere with seven year cicada plagues which i do <laughs> um so there years one through six probably not going to have the plague of cicadas you're seven you're doomed now what you don't know is exactly which day in summer the plague of cicadas is going to fall upon your house so so when we say that we are overdue for an asteroid impact that's not entirely true. It's not like like your cicada example. These asteroids show up, 
on the schedule. It's just that if you average it out over the history of the earth, that's the, how often and, you get and, it. And this is where I have the qualifier of we don't fully know, because it could be that there's some higher order effect where every 200 and something years, maybe there is this increased, oh, oh dear, we're all going to get thumped and we don't know. So, so that's one possibility we don't know, right. just to be clear, don't know. Um, then the other situation that we don't know is, is there a sufficient family of comets and asteroids that have orbits that uh, encounter the planet Earth, that we're looking more at a radioactive decay where any given day may not see something but the probability is such that 65,000 years from now it won't be half of them have hit the earth but it will be one of them has hit the earth right right but <clears throat> you know with the cicada example right you've got that you've got this very specific time frame that it's happening this you know, no cicadas in every seventh year the cicadas show up. But we, and as you said, you know, there could be some kind of cycle where the probabilities increase because of perturbations from Jupiter or, you know, some, you know, other stars, or some kind of brown dwarf star that's in a close proximity, or sometimes the the sun passes above the the plane of the Milky Way and then back in, and it increases the the odds. But still. You know, all you're getting is an increase of odds, but yes, but you're it not, doesn't guarantee it will happen. Getting a guarantee of this of this event happening, right now, then you have situations where the probability of something occurring over time increases. This is where we look suspiciously at the volcanoes. So right after a volcano has erupted, when its magma chamber is nice and empty and it doesn't have a reason to go kablooey and fill the atmosphere with airplane grounding ash. Um, this is a situation where immediately after super low probability, yeah, weirdness happens. We don't fully understand our planet, but over time pressure can grow and grow and grow underneath a volcano. The magma chamber fills up, the ground uplifts, and at a certain point, the outward pressure of that magma starts to unbalance the ability of the volcano not to go kablooey. And we don't have the full capacity to understand all the triggering events because we have to worry about things like, well, frictional effects. We have to worry about how frozen the ground is, how much ice and snow is on top of it if it's Iceland. Um, what are other seismic effects that might jiggle it loose? There, there are so many different factors that we can't say precisely this volcano is going off in the next three days until it starts giving off steam, in which case we can say it's probably going off in the next three days, but it might actually give us three minutes warning. At the same time, we can say this volcano is definitely becoming higher probability and will go off like they just said with the volcano in Naples. They elevated it from, it's pretty darn quiet, you can pretty much ignore it, to scientists need to be watching this now. Right. Uh, a, a great, uh, oh, I forget the name, the Torino scale. That's right. So, so yeah. the uh, astronomers have studied asteroids and they've developed this idea called the Torino scale. And it is all about probabilities, right? It is all about looking at these various objects and determining if, you know, looking at their orbits and looking at how often they cross the earth and how close they are and their mass and things like this, what are the chances that it's going to impact the earth at some point down into the future and, and the the higher that possibility comes, it enters the Torino scale somewhere between one and, and 10, 10 being we're doomed, <laughs> one being maybe, just maybe in the, in the far future, this object is gonna get close enough that it could strike the earth. And it's the same thing, right? You, it allows you to shift the probability 
for these individual objects around. And so we used to think it was 1 in 100,000, and now we think it's 1 in 10,000, and now we think there's a 10% chance, and now we think there's a 15% chance, but or, and now we think there's a 1 in a million chance again that, you know, for each one of these objects. But once again, it's, you know, in some cases this stuff, as with your with your volcano, right, it's either not going to hit or it's, it's, it's hitting right now. And, and <laughs> you know, the volcano, it's either not... You know, we don't know if it's going to go off or it's going off right now. And anything in between is just us pulling numbers out of the hat. Let's talk about weather. Okay. Yeah. So so same thing. You know, I look at my cell phone app and it tells me that I have a, well, just, I always have 100% chance of rain here on the West Coast. But no, it'll tell me, you know, I have a, there you go, f- tomorrow I have a 50% chance of showers. Does that mean it's going to rain for half the day? Does that mean that I'm going to, you know, I have a 50-50 chance of of you know flip a coin and i might have rain tomorrow in general what it means and there's a chance your app presents it in a different manner i reserve the right for an app developer to have done something strange usually what that means is your friendly neighborhood went weather man woman scientist ran a gazillion computer models And the computer models basically did the, well, if this happens, if that happens, given these conditions, how many of these scenarios have you being rained upon? And based on all possible outcomes, they predict 50% of the time with these scenarios you're getting rained upon because you live on vancouver island i fully blame your location right but but the weather prediction for tomorrow is going to be more accurate than the weather prediction because it's going to tell me even at what time during the day i'm going to see rain 10 days from now i'm going to have a 60 percent chance of showers uh saturday january 28th so what that doesn't include is error bars. And and the reason that it gets more accurate over time is because some of the variables get locked in on a value. So the, the way to think of this is if you've ever played a uh, Robo Rally, it's, it's a board game where you get to program your robot to try and get to a flag. And you, you can set what each bracket's going to be, but if you get shot, you end up losing the ability to change some of these tiles. So if, if you're trying to figure out what someone else is going to do and you can't see any of their variables, you have to, to run through the, well, the most likely card they'll get is this, the most likely card they'll get is that. This is, this is the range of things they can do, and it turns out it's pretty extensive. That's our 10-day forecast. There's a whole lot of things that, that could happen 10 days from now. But if they've had an unfortunate game and they've been shot up pretty badly, and five of those registers are locked so that you know they're going to turn right, then they're going to go forward three, then they're going to go backwards one. If you know what they're going to do for five of those variables, where they're going to end up is locked into a very small set of possibilities. With the weather, when you're 24 hours out, you know what the current temperature is. You know what the current humidity is. You know where the high pressure is. You know where the low pressure is. That makes it far easier because your registers are locked and remaining places that things can go are much smaller. And so, you know, back to sort of the mistakes that we make in in probability, uh, do, you know, do you see in research journals people making mistakes or do you see us as journalists uh, messing up and not understanding how probability works. Is that that's so, more likely, so isn't it? Journalists sure. do the most amazing, complete failure to pay any attention to probability, um, unless you're Nate Silberman um, or the guys at Princeton. Well, I mean, 
I'm going to yeah. continue on the question in a second, but Nate Silverman was a great example, right? Because Nate Silvers, because you're right. Um, you, you know, with predicting the outcome of the election at some point, he was predicting a thirty percent one person winning, seventy percent another person winning, uh, and in the end, the who did win was a bit of a surprise. But that is probability. That you're going yes. to get sometimes the 30% outcome, not the 70% outcome. Right, yeah. right. All right, so and let's go back to how, how journalists screw this up. So so a lot of times uh, they'll say like such and such gives you cancer because in a rat study, X percent of the rats got cancer after being fed in a, di a diet entirely made of this thing. And they don't take into consideration, well, what's the probability that some of those rats would have gotten cancer anyways? They don't take into cons um, consideration what is the probability that only feeding rats X, right. because they're not getting Y and Z, causes cancer. Lack of Y and Z causes cancer is not what you hear. Right. So th so that, that example, right, if, you know, if it says like it doubles your chance of getting cancer, it, it gives you a 100% additional chance of getting cancer, but your chances of getting cancer of this variety is super extremely low, that additional 100% or increases cancer risk by 40% is actually not a lot. And and it the the it doubles your chance of is one of those red alert phrases. Because if your chance of getting struck by lightning, and I don't know what your actual chance of being struck by lightning is, I'm making numbers up here. If your chance of being struck by lightning while walking across the field in the summer in Illinois on any random summer day is one in 100,000 because we have a lot of lightning strikes here. And your chance is doubled if you put a giant pole on top of your head. You're still not going to get struck by lightning. Right, even though you have indeed doubled your chances or qu quadrupled your chances or multiple your chances by a hundred you're still not going to get hit by lightning because the no. the original probability of this event occurring is incredibly low and even, on a random summer day and so you, like if if right. i told you to go out and walk across a field on july 17th wearing a giant pole on your head um you're good. Now, right. the thing is, this is also partially a deterministic probability, because if there's already a thunder and lightning storm going on, don't do it. I like you. <laughs> right. So the chances of you getting struck by lightning by walking out into a lightning storm with a lightning rod on your head, they have noticeably increased. Yes. Although still probably very rare. Yes. Just don't do it. Like, we're still not recommending that you do it. Right. Right. Um, so, so then what can we as the general public do when we are reading research reports, when we are, we are looking at studies, how can we recognize this probability misunderstanding in ourselves and compensate for us? So, so what we really want to do is ask, what is the chance in terms of like one in a thousand, one in 10,000? You don't want the, your chance doubled because it doubled compared to what? You don't know. Uh, you do want to know what is the error on something? Because if the chance of something happening is one in five plus or minus one in five, twenty percent. Mm -hmm. Then that starts to look kind of different, right? If it so, so, so I guess that's the point, right? Is that if if you see a study and they say that um, d performing, you know, driving a vehicle <clears throat> increases your chances of something else by one hundred percent, that is possibly meaningless. But if they say that that if you are dri you know driving a vehicle while texting and increases your your one in ten thousand chance of dying in a motor vehicular accident to one in a thousand, that's a significant number that you should take very seriously. Right. 
Right. Right. The, and it's that it's that one, you know, it's knowing that probability, it's knowing that one in whatever, that's the number that you've really got to focus in, not necessarily the increase, because the increase is meaningless if you don't know what the original percentage is. Okay? Yeah. Yep. Let's talk about the error bar. So so how would error bars be described in you know if I'm reading some study or if I'm reading the newspaper? So error bars come in a lot of different varieties <laughs> and this this causes reading to be required. There are, for instance, uh, error bars that uh, are one standard deviation, which which means it's a very, very narrow error bar. So if it's one standard deviation error bars, it means there's actually a pretty good chance that something is is going to fall outside of that. So those are overly optimistic error bars. Right. Um, so you you have to be careful. In in science, we often look at six sigma error bars, which when when you start looking at that, you are um, looking at six times the standard deviation where really if you have a giant population everything in your giant population should for the most part fall within your six sigma error bars now now queuing this up you want to talk a bit about uh, radioactivity and how sort of we see probability and prediction with rel with uh, with radioactivity so so when we start looking at radioactivity um, with radioactivity, it's it's not a looking at a single atom. I know exactly what this particular atom is. It's saying that given a a full population of of particles, then you're going to um, expect half of them but you don't know which half it could be all of the ones on the left it could be a random distribution of them you don't know which ones will have decayed and it could be that they all decide to sit there and go no i won't decay but the greatest probability is half of them will have decayed in one half life and because you're dealing with so many particles all at the same time you are getting this distribution, this average, and generally, you'll end up with half the element, as you know, as per the half life. Right, and and this is one of those things where how well it fits the equation is a direct function of having more things in your population. So if you have a population of four happy little nuclear isotopes sitting there, it is one of these things where they're not as likely to have the exact two of them, then one of them, then zero of them are left just because there's, there's four and that's a lot to ask. Um, the more you have, the better the fit of what's observed to the theoretical model is going to be. D do you think that there's any way that that we can can get good at this, or do you think that this is sort of one of those fundamental weaknesses of of human beings, and we should always be aware and alert in ourselves? Um, as, as human beings, we're we're wetware that comes with a whole lot of predetermined biases built in yeah. features, not bugs. I'm told. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and our inability to notice bias, our inability to notice how we preferentially view things as having a higher probability or a lower probability, isn't going to get inherently better. That, that's the code. I have to figure out how to monkey patch the code by recompiling it with a new set of parameters and and that's called getting an education monkey patch i love that <laughs> that is that is a new quote of the week i think that's so, awesome 
So we're, we're biased creatures and we just have to figure out through education how to uh, overcome all of our built-in bias. Yeah. I, well, I think that example you gave of like, if you see that something increases the probability of something by some number, 100%, 200%, 17,000%, you can literally feel free to ignore that until someone tells yeah. you what the actual odds are. And, and, and that to other seriously, that if something says it's within one standard deviation, just sort of raise, I can't raise one eyebrow on cue, yeah. raise Ignore one eyebrow yeah. in a very questioning way at it. Yeah. If it's two sigma, we're, you're still only looking at 65% of the population fits in that. So it's, it's only when you start to get out to six sigma, where you're at basically everything, that you can start to go, yeah, that's a completely reasonable error bar. All right. Well, thanks, Pamela. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Right. And now we save. And now we save. Um, oh, you're, did your dog make you allergic? No, I have con cut crud. Oh, con. Always con crud. Yeah, this is 436. Yeah. Eddie is now just lying here with my doorstop in his mouth. I'm going to remove my doorstop from my oh, dog's mouth. Poor pup. He chose to put the doorstop in his mouth. What are you doing? Okay. Oh. Tasty. But we can blame the audience for summoning him. And the, yes, and the it's damage. true. So, uh, so for those of you who joined late, there was a request to see my dog that led to my dog locked in my office for this episode. And he's still a bit of a puppy. Uh, Galaxy is wondering what con crud is. Con crud is that, is that <laughs> illness that you pick up whenever you go to a convention and you have to interact with a whole bunch of other human beings and you bring back the dreaded lurgy. Yeah, it's, it's these, you're, you're exposed to all sorts of people from all sorts of places that you don't have Im immune immunity to yeah. their common bugs. Yeah. And everyone goes home with something new to have their immune system fight. Yeah, it's a, it's a really, it's a, it's a convention for diseases. Um, how was the convention? It was really good. Yeah. It, it was a chance to see a bunch of old friends, see babies belonging to a bunch of old friends, um, talk science, eat good food. Can't really complain. Where, where was it located? Boston. Boston. Yeah. All right. Um, Alf Tupper says, wow, that was a quick goodbye. Well, we sort of churned up a lot of time in the beginning, and so I, I had to, I, I decided I wanted to wrap it up. Um, we still recorded for 31 minutes. Yes, yeah, yeah, it happened. Uh, for normal distributions, Jason 93609, for normal distributions, two standard deviations contain about 96% of the probability. Yeah. Um, well, four distributions do. Two is 68, four is 95, six is 99.7. Mm. Um, let's see. Hit us with your questions. Oh, I just saw Arrival last night. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen any of the new movies it's yet. It's good. It's good. Yeah, I liked it. Um, and then I've also been... They, they released the Long War mod for... Uh, for XCOM 2, so now I'm going to play the whole game all over again. It looks. Speaking of probability, you uh, you know when you're about to take the shot in the game and kill an alien, it shows you what the percentages are for you to hit, and, and uh -huh. you know like I've got an eighty, I've got an eighty six percent chance, and I can shoot twice. Fine, I'll shoot, and then you shoot once, you miss, and you're like, well, that one missed, but the, this one's going to hit because. I already got my miss out of the way on the 86% chance, but of course you can miss again no. at 86% chance because it's No, so so a good example of this that can screw people up is um a fairly common surgery that people have, which I've had because 
bad sinuses is sinus surgery to make breathing easier um, when things get screwed up inside your sinuses. And there's a roughly 30% chance when you have the surgery that there'll be some sort of nerve damage. Now, it's also quite common that you have to have the surgery more than once because if you have problems with your sinuses once, you're probably going to have it again. Mm -hmm. And, and this does not mean that if you have the surgery three times, you are going to have nerve damage. It's each surgery is a 30% chance. Right. So you can just keep rolling those dice, but that's, I think that's a great example, right? That you were like, well, I've had it twice. It's that third time that I think I'm going to get some nerve damage. So as long as I don't have the surgery three times, I'll be fine. Yeah. Right. Doesn't quite work Doesn't that quite way. Work. Um, age of atheism. What are the probabilities of life on other planets with what we know? Um, we don't know enough. Yeah. There was a interesting research report that just came out where people kind of back calculated the Drake equation for the history of the universe. And according to their calculation, the chances that we are the first civilization in the universe is one in billions. But, but as I always say, then where are they? Um, right. Where are their monoliths? So, uh, and, and the answer is we don't know simply because there there's so many chances that it could be, hey, something got destroyed, lots of things got destroyed, or uh, yeah, we there's so many different variables in the Drake equation and we haven't locked in any of them. Well, we've, we've locked in many, and now that we're getting more research about uh, planets orbiting other stars, but a lot of the other ones, yeah, we have... We really... haven't locked in any of the life-related ones. Right, or things moving into uh, levels of civilization, what are the chances of them destroying themselves, like, none of that we know. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so, mur, mur, mur. Uh, I still think the, the Fermi Paradox just rules overall. Um... Stu H, how much influence does the moon have on earth plate tectonics? Um, there, it's been found that there is an, an increased probability that if the moon is straight overhead, you will have minor earthquakes. This has nothing to do with the phase of the moon. It does not matter if it is a full moon, if it is a new moon. Having the moon straight overhead, you go outside, you look up, the moon is straight up. There is a small chance that this will increase the already low chance of you having a earthquake right and uh by so, the way uh the moon is at apogee right now so happy apogee that is exciting Not really. and how how did you know that uh i knew that from the uh year in space 2017 desk calendar not from our fabulous Faces of the Moon app, but... Uh... <laughs> That's what oh, I no, thought it's, you were uh, Sorry, it's tomorrow. Talk. Moon at Apogee tomorrow. Faces of the Moon okay. will tell me exactly when uh, when Apogee is. But we don't actually okay. seek for Apogee. We, we only seek for the next full moon. But this is always the funny thing, right? When people talk about, like, you know, it's, it's full moon, and boy, it's got to be crazy tonight. Because There's think no the... statistical yeah, well, evidence. And... And that, that. The, how close the moon is and how full the moon is are two completely different things and may have no, uh, you know, no correlation. Yeah. Ryo San says, I have never seen the moon directly overhead. That's because you don't live near the equator. The, yeah. The, the you moon have to is, live in the right range of latitudes to get the moon straight overhead. I think the moon has an 11 degree inclination off the tilt of the earth so if you live within 11 degrees of the equator of the earth and now i'm literally making stuff up uh then you have a chance of seeing the moon directly overhead but i'm at the 49 i'm at the 50th parallel i don't know about you a little south of um me. i'm 30 something oh really yeah yeah um people don't realize how but how far south we are on vancouver <laughs> island Oh yeah, you know, people in Norway and stuff are are close. You know, sixtieth closing in. You know, if you're Oslo is like sixtieth parallel. I don't know how I went down to that uh, down that rabbit hole. Um, uh, 
Let's see. So Eli Avron is saying, first time I went abroad, I freaked out that the moon was too low in the sky. Yeah, that's funny, right? Because you're, I think you're out of Israel, right? So uh, it, it was, we, here we see the moon as like this very distinct sea crescent in the sky. Yeah. Um, but then when we were down in Costa Rica, it was rolled over, which was really neat. And I know for the for the folks in Australia, it's upside down. It's the other way around. So, uh, so, or, so or right side up in, and we're upside down. I get it, Australia. Um, it, in, in saying that, the sea flips this direction. It doesn't flip this direction because the crescent side is always pointed towards the sun. Right. It's always pointed towards the the west. Yeah, I know you know this. Yes. But yeah. but I read a book that had that screwed up and it just left me it was like Yeah. That, that doesn't work. But it is super weird to see the the moon upside down. Yes. I'm, yes. The old man on the moon standing on his head. Yeah. Um Let's see. Hugo Burham says, sadly, my age is now greater than my latitude. <laughs> uh, you can just keep going north or south. Yes. Um, uh, MC Deuce wants to know, what if the moon was made of green cheese? Hmm. What if the moon was made of green cheese? Uh, cheese has a density greater than water. Let's find so, the density of cheese. Let me just do some math here. It's six. You know, it's going to be denser than water. So. And the density um, of the moon. Hold on. So the density of the moon is 3.34 grams per cubic centimeter. Density of cheese. Three point nine five. Cheese is denser than the moon. No. I can't get easy density. Uh, this might be an episode of the Guide to Space here. Um, oh, here we go. So cheese, depending... feta cheese. Found a calculator. But it's giving me calories, not... I want density. No, this is tough. It's a hard one. Volume to weight. See densities and calculate volumes and weights of cheeses. This is hard. Okay. Uh, <laughs> 1.89 grams per centimeter cubed. And what so, did I, and what did I say the, the moon, moon was? was? The moon is 3.34. So, so the moon is roughly double the density of cheese. So that means tides would be substantially less yep. because the tides are due to the mass of the moon, but the moon's orbit would not change because the earth is, is the dominant mass to worry about. Right. The, the, what matters is the distance of, from the moon to the earth. That right. defines its orbital velocity, not the mass of the moon. So all you yeah. would really get would be um, – You'd get lower tides. And what about the albedo? What's the albedo of cheese compared to the albedo of the moon? I don't know. Hmm. It would also depend on the texture. Okay, hold on. Yan Dryak wants to know how many calories the moon would have. <laughs> okay, hold on. Hold on. Let me see if I can do this. Is the like... moon burnable? <laughs> Is the moon. Well, That's cheese. How you get no, no, but no, it was made of cheese, right? right? Oh, okay. Right? So the the volume of the moon in grams, uh, sorry, the moon in grams, the mass of the moon in grams. I love Wolfram Alpha for this kind of thing. Yes. Uh, here, I'll, okay, so the mass of the moon in grams, I'll just show my screen here for a second here. All right, so the mass of the moon in grams is 7.34 times 10 to the 25 grams. Uh, so now we do... You want to do the volume of the moon, figure out density times... So so volume... Well, don't uh, I know the, 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 the calorie per gram of cheese? 
So density is mass over volume. So you want to do density times volume to get at the mass of cheese. And then from the mass of cheese, you can get the calories. Four calories per gram. So I'm going to take the mass of the moon. Because, we're, right, we're not using our mass of the cheese moon. We're using the, oh, we have to use our mass of our cheese moon, don't we? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So this, this is where you have to do density times volume to get at the mass. Okay. But I've said roughly half the mass. We said roughly half the mass, right? So we're just going to knock. So I'm going to take 7.34 times 10 to 25 grams. I'm going to multiply it by 4. Okay. Which is, and then I'm going to divide it by 2. So multiply it by 2. So 7.34 times 2. So 1.4 times 10 to the 26 calories is the moon. Which a 10 to the 26, I don't even know what that number is. It would solve starvation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Unless you're lactose intolerant. And then and then Jason 93609 is wondering how we would calculate the albedo of cheese. Again, uh, albedo of cheese. Let me just see. What is the it reflectivity? It depends on the texture. So if it's a nice, smooth yeah. cheese, it's going to be much more reflective than if its surface is scuffed up. Uh, surface reflectivity of cheese. Hmm. Because you would. That's actually, I love what you could Google. Mm hmm. Uh, so it, so I mean um, the reflectivity is way higher because the moon is like literally as as the albedo of the moon is very dark. It is like coal, right? So so you would get a reflectivity that would be higher. So the moon would be brighter because it would be the same size because it's got this lower density, but it's going to be brighter. So it's because the cheese is going to have a way higher reflectivity than than the, the moon itself. If anyone can give us an albedo in the comments, that would be really helpful. Uh, uh, there you go. Someone must be saying that... Uh, uh, white mold cheese is an albedo of nearly 100%. So if you – and the moon is like 8%, right? So if you had – so if it was 10 times higher albedo than uh, than the moon, would it be 10 times brighter? Like if you get a, a, a no, 10 times multiplier. Because, no. All right. No, because it, it has to go as the area. So it goes – and and brightness is often logarithmic, so it depends on which equation you're using. So it 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 goes nonlinear quickly, depending on if you're looking at brightness in a logarithmic or a non-logarithmic right. scale, and it goes as the area as well, which Let's, is to where albedo to let's see if I can find an albedo to brightness scale. That does, it doesn't work that way. Okay. Yeah. Like I said, it goes nonlinear. Well, that's what I mean. Like just some kind of logarithmic. <clears throat> I'm going to randomly point out I have hair that's the exact color of my shirt quite by accident. <laughs> I didn't even notice. I didn't either. And then I noticed that like my <sighs> shirt was moving weirdly. So Zeth Loveless wants to know, would it form a thicker atmosphere? So, right. So let's think about it here. We've got the moon. It's made of cheese. It's getting pummeled. It's going to have less gravity, so it's going to Has, it's going to lose it if you gave it an. So it will outgas any trapped right. moisture in it, so it will very quickly become desiccated cheese. Right. So it will even lose more mass once all that water's lost. Right. Okay. Now, now the question from Janelle: What about asteroids? Uh, sorry. Yeah, Janelle. What about the asteroids? They hit the cheese moon. Um, you would get uh, dust of cheese. What is the the elasticity of cheese compared of to desiccated cheese? The elasticity. Well, we haven't decided whether we've got like we just created a cheese right now, or whether this is cheese that's been around since the beginning of the of the solar system. So, if it's fresh cheese, it's going to melt on impact. So you now have queso. Right. The whole thing. With the temperature. Because you don't have to get very warm, right? Right. Right. It takes it's rock cheese. a lot to melt. And, well, so so you're going to have the rock, which its kinetic energy is getting transferred into heat energy, which is getting turned into queso. And and so 
assuming the rock stops frictionally inside the moon somewhere and doesn't just like pass straight through because I don't know the stopping power of a moon of cheese. Um, but but assuming that it gets embedded inside, it will radiate away all of its its heat into the cheese. But if you had a block of cheese left over from the formation of the solar system, would that would it, be awesome. Would it still have some kind of core energy difference? And so no, because like cheese a... actually radiates heat away fairly quickly. This is why you burn the roof of your mouth. Right. Right. So you really have to take into account the uh, the thermal gradient of cheese. Yeah. Right. Uh, now, you... cheese is more of an insulator than tomato sauce. Right. But it would still radiate heat fairly effectively. But I wonder, though, if you would get, like, if it would be left over from the, the formation of the solar system and you would have the this sort of center of cheesy goodness in the middle of this more desiccated outer layer of cheese, right? If and would Mars, you get some kind if of. If Mars could cool off, I'm betting that a cheesy moon would cool off. Would cheese rotating cheese inside a cheese shell creates some kind of magnetosphere though i wonder but what would happen the number, of, the number of free electrons and cheese is pretty low and what about sort of 4.5 billion years of you know being under the uh the radiation from the sun uh would it tear the cheese moon apart or would no, it no because because space itself so so i'd be much more worried about the desiccation that would happen it's just like mercury has a cracked surface from contracting it's right. going to get one heck of a it's it's going to desiccate on the outside first and then the inside it's going to shrink you'll have like cracky awfulness on the surface right and the whole thing it will get gruesome Quickly. All right. Well, I Mummified think we, cheese. I think we got to the bottom of this, which is that it's ridiculous. This is the most awesome conversation we've ever had on this show. <laughs> Someone says we should release this as a addendum <laughs> to our normal astronomy cast. Done. We will do that. We will. <laughs> we will get Chad to uh, to pull this out of the the video feed, and we will release it in the uh, in the astronomy cast feed because that got weird. Um, <laughs> Larry Beckham is putting cheese is not ferromagnetic. <laughs> that's true. All right. Uh, well, hey, I think uh, that's what you get if you don't give us a lot of really great questions. You get us just, <laughs> just going down whatever rabbit hole we start on. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us this week. Uh, and thanks, of course, Pamela, for both talking about probability and the moon being made of cheese. Um, next week i don't know what we're going to talk about i i threw a bunch of topics your your way so so uh prepare to be surprised. i'm not gonna say it's aliens but it's aliens. but it's aliens of course it's all i ever want to talk about um okay cool i anything else no all right we'll see everybody next week